and uh, that's not okay. And it being wrong does not depend on maybe like how many good ends they have. So it's the capacity. Um, so it's the capacity to set ends that's the source of value in the world. Um, so it's the fact that some object or state of affairs was willed rationally that explains why that thing has value, that is objective value. So Kant thinks that if anything at all has value, then the capacity rationally to will exists, because that's the only way that something comes to have value. And that capacity rationally to will is itself must be a source of respect and esteem. It has to be treated as an end in itself. This capacity to make something objectively valuable by rational willing. Now, of course, Kant thinks that we, we do take certain things to be good when we give ourselves that. And we will certain states of affairs. That's just, that just is to take something to be good. So by willing, by the fact that each of us wills an end. We're taking something to be objectively good. So we're committed to uh, taking those ends to be objectively good. So we're committed to treating wills, rational nature, as the source of that objective value. And therefore, we're committed to treating wills, the source of that value, as ends in themselves. So if there's a categorical imperative that identifies unconditional value, then its end is um, rational nature as an end in itself. Not in the sense of something to be brought about, but as identifying the source of that value. Um, So, a couple implications of this. Um, rational wills are supposed to be ends in themselves. So, um, so, when we recognize a rational will, that is, when we recognize a person as being an end in themselves, well, um, this means that we recognize their capacity to make their ends objectively good, objectively valuable. Uh, and that means um, that when somebody, I say that again? So when we recognize someone else as a person, as having a will, as having practical reason, we're recognizing them things as an end in themselves, that means as being a source of ends, a source of objective value. We're recognizing their capacity to bestow objective value on objects, on states of affairs, by rationally willing them, by adopting maxims that could be universalized uh, and then actually adopting them. Taking that end. So the value of a human being is based on their potential to do good? Uh, it's not. So it's based on their potential to, as it were, make good. Right? So the reason I'm hesitating to say do good is that it makes it look like, you might not have been suggesting that, but it makes it sound like there's already something good and the person is valuable because they produce that stuff. Right? And that's not right. So, 
So a person is valuable not because they are useful at, at, at achieving what we already know to be good. But they have the ability to, but they have the ability to make something be good. To bring it out good. To bring it about that things are good. If People are the creators of good. That's right. Through rational will. There is nothing that is already like set good, so they can't do Sorry, good. Maybe I'm just wording it improperly. So, without rational wills, nothing would be good. There would be no ends. It would just be as were the phenomenal world of science with one thing causing another without anything being an end and therefore anything being good. So the ability to rationally will is what makes people intrinsically valuable already? Exactly. Okay. That's what, mean, that's what it means to say that somebody is an end in themselves. That they have the ability to create ends. That is the ability to create objective value. I should, I should add. And the ability to create ends rationally. And therefore, to create objective value. Okay. Well, so treating somebody as an end in themselves means obviously treating them as having intrinsic value. And so, immediately from that, we get the wrongness of denying them the capacity to set and pursue ends of rational. So how, might, so how might I deny somebody the capacity rationally to set and pursue their ends? So this would be like an example of something that would be wrong, acting against somebody as having intrinsic value, acting against somebody as an end in themselves. Let me have an example of something that is not that involves acting contrary to treating someone as an end in themselves. Slavery. Okay, so slavery is a wrong thing because why? We're treating them more as a means rather than them. Okay, so in slavery, I'm precisely denying somebody the capacity to set and pursue their own ends. I'm treating them as a tool to be used, a, a, a biological machine to be used for my ends, rather than allowing them to set and pursue their own ends. Okay. Imprisonment? Sure, imprisonment also. Um, how about... Yeah. Wouldn't imprisonment be cheating them as an end to be punishing them for something wrong they've done? Punishment is going to be a, 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 something that will may be mentioned in the context of the doctrine of right. Well, doesn't Kant say that we punish somebody for doing something wrong with our treatment as an end? Um, so punishment is, as I say, a, a difficult issue for Kant. And all I'll say about it now is that it's not something that we can do, it's not something that we can do with justice individually. So punishment is going to be essentially an element of public right, and not private right. Punishment is something that's only going to be justified when we have, I would say, a legitimate political order. It's not something that we do as an individual to somebody else. Um, OK, so good. Uh, another example would be to um, make a lying promise. So how is a lying promise interfering with somebody's ability to set and pursue their ends? Ability rationally to set and pursue their ends. Because they think that you're going to fulfill something for them and you're not. Right, so you're exactly going behind the back of their reason, so to speak, manipulating them in a way that does not allow them rationally to set and pursue their ends. Okay. Um, okay, so those are ways of failing to treat somebody as an end in themselves. But of course, what makes them an end in themselves 
is their ability to set and pursue ends. That is, their ability to make ends be objectively valid. And so, um, when they do that, when they, when they act, when somebody acts on a permissible maximum to pursue a permissible end, and they thereby make that end objectively good, my respect for them, my respect for their capacity to do that, means what about that end? So we've just been talking about how respect for a person as an end in themselves means that I can't act against their capacity to set pursue it, obviously. But there's more to it than that. Respecting a person as having the capacity to set and pursue ends means that when they do rationally set and pursue some permissible end, it's objectively valuable. So some, if someone lacks the capacity to rationally pursue their own ends, is it okay to treat them as such? Somebody lacks the completely lacks the capacity to pursue an end. What would we say about that? So it, yeah, I mean, it has to be an extreme case. It has to be one where a person cannot literally take the first step toward something, cannot do anything toward accomplishing something. What would we say about that case? Sounds like they wouldn't have will. They wouldn't have will. At most, we can say that they're wishing something, but that's not a, that's not a, that's not having a will. A will is being able to make yourself the cause of something. Right. So it has to be an extreme case where you can't do anything in pursuit of an end. Right? So, look, uh, you can imagine cases of temporary paralysis. Right? That's not the case that Kant's going to be worried about. Um, it's the case where literally you can't bring about any end. Well, that's a case where there's not a will. Yeah, it would be like, uh, like Terry Shango or something, like where you, you might have no will to do something, even no means at all to act upon the will. In, in what sense would you say there's a will to do something? Not, not will in the way Kant defines yeah. it, but will in the sense where you want to do an action or what you want to do. Absolutely no means to do Yeah. Okay, so but I want to. But that means that the person doesn't have any value about by his standards then? Mm, right, so uh, I hesitate to say that there's a person in that case. The answer is that's right, there's an object, not a person. Some of that, that, that's maybe a body yeah. that does not, that's not an end in itself. Huh. Okay, so let me, let me get to the point I'm trying to make, which is um, acting in a way that conflicts with treating somebody as an end in themselves is either acting to deny them the capacity to set and pursue ends, or when they do set and pursue a rational end, treating the person as an end in themselves means treating that end as what? Recognizing a person's capacity to make ends objectively good means that when they do act rationally and do give themselves an end and do make that end objectively good, you have to recognize that end as objectively good. In other words, it has to be something that is one of your ends. Now, I've said many times now that you have many ends. And exactly how their ends get integrated with yours and exactly how you pursue them is something that is indeterminate. So we get a positive duty here to pursue to assist in the pursuit of their permissible ends. That's where the next comes from. And that's what's required in order to treat somebody as an end of themselves. Okay, uh, so we'll finish up part two, get started with part three on Friday, and finish part three uh, on Monday and get started with